Thanks, Max. Recording started. Thank you very much. And Laura, did you want to come in immediately to mention something? Yeah. Yeah, I was just checking around Quora, see Max. Um, yeah. Don't think we're quite there yet. <laughs> um, yeah. Let me just check. I know we had seven governors with us at the previous session. All right. Uh, you see Caroline's with us now as well, so that's great. Hi, Caroline. And yes, so, we need ten to be quiet. Okay, I can see Hardev's with us as well. Got eight. Yeah. You got me. And Teddy. Yeah. 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 Mm. So yeah, we've got eight at the moment. So I think we're missing Mark and Helen yeah. and Ruth. Oh, yes, you're right. Yeah, yeah. There's still uh, yeah. And If you got any voting to do, do these early before four o'clock. Look <laughs> for that. So we could, yeah, we can look at that anytime. So I, can see Tariq's. <laughs> I can see Tariq's here. I can see obviously uh, Adel, Caroline, and uh, Wendy. Thanks here. Yeah, uh, Ruth's not with us yet, then, is she? So okay, mm -hmm. that's fine. And I can see that uh, is David with us yet. Yeah. I think so. Yes, hi David. Yeah, yeah. So that's great. And Kirsch, I think, is is in as well. Yeah, he is. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Tariq certainly. Yeah. Alistair, Adrian, is Adrian with us? Yeah. Yes, he is. Yeah, Adrian's with us. And Alistair's with us as well. Yeah, yeah. So one, two, three, four, five. I think you're right. Yeah, yeah. We've got eight, haven't we, so far? Well, yeah. And we need ten to record it, do we? We'll still conduct, I'm sure we'll still conduct business, of course, but uh, yeah, it's just any any formal approvals. Yeah, we might have yes. to uh, do via email. Um, yes. But, yeah. Yes, that's OK. That's all right. So I don't know whether any, if any governor colleagues or Jackie wishes to uh, just see it. It's actually only Ruth, isn't it? That's uh, not here that was with us before. So. That's fine. Yeah, so I'm trying to contact um, yeah. those of the governors who aren't here. Yeah, that's fine, Jackie. Yeah. Thanks very much. Yeah. OK, OK. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and a, a warm welcome to you all to our uh, Council of Governors meeting for uh, for January. Uh, great to have you with us. Um, thanks to all of you. I realise this can be quite a long day for governors, so we will try and be succinct and get to the point and uh, get to the, the, the issues you wish to raise with us, of course. But you'll have had your own pre-meeting, then a, a really good session, thank you, uh, with the non-exec directors, uh, which a number of matters were uh, were discussed. So I'll obviously talk about those in a moment. Um, so, and then in terms of our business, uh, I do want, just want to begin by uh, uh, complimenting um, John and Karen and Pat. I think Pat's with us. Yes, she is, yeah, uh, yeah for joining us. Have I missed any... Uh, work colleagues now. I don't think I have, have I? So that's fine. I do know that some have had to give apologies, but to have John here obviously representing the position of the uh, Chief Executive Officer as uh, as Mel's deputy, um, to have Karen here, of course, as our Chief Nurse and uh, offering an, uh, an insight into the operations at the moment, uh, and to have Pat here as our Director of HR, um, taking us through some um, staffing updates, and uh, matters that have uh, been raised with her, for example, the uh, take up of um, uh, counselling services was a matter of interest to governors and Pat knows that that's of interest. So, um, but I did just want to begin by uh, commending those three executive directors for joining us, given that we are all under extreme pressure. Uh, we, there is external influence on us to stop doing anything that uh, can, can avoid being done whilst we get on with treating as many patients as, as we can. So the, the significant operational pressure and of course, and I won't go through names or anything like that, but colleagues who would normally be supporting some of our governor's processes are um, redeployed into, into other areas to try and assist with the, uh, the operational pressures. So John, Karen, Pat, thank you very much for joining governors for um, a bit of time uh, at the beginning of this meeting. So thank you for that. Um, our meeting, guys, we're, we're going to hear from our executive colleagues to bring us right up to date, right to today uh, with the current situation. We'll check our minutes, of course, of the October meeting, any matters arising from that. 
we'll think about the uh, the pre-meet that we had with uh, non-exec directors and the issues that arise from that and I'll obviously advise exec colleagues of what they are there'll be no surprises there I promise you but important issues raised by governors um, we will uh, there's an opportunity of course for any matters that have been raised with governors to be raised with us and uh, we'll deal with the chairman's reports and the nominations and remunerations uh, reports we then have the report from boards uh, uh, reports from the board, sorry, of the uh, Audit Committee, Transport Funds Committee and Academy Minutes. And it's great to see that there's a significant number of appendices there so that colleagues can, can get those. So that's what we intend to get through. Um, I will ask whether there is any other business to be raised before I start this meeting proper. But uh, does anybody have any other business that ought to be added as an, as an agenda item, please? I'm going to take that as no, so we would be happy to at least get through uh, the things that we've set ourselves. So that's great. OK, uh, may I begin our Council of Governors by um, uh, asking us all to uh, just pay a moment in, in respect and remembrance to our uh, colleague uh, and friend, Alan English, uh, a, a terrific governor with us, a friend and colleague uh, who and Alan sadly um, passed away. Uh, earlier this month. So may I say as chairman, may he rest in peace. And uh, I, I'm sure you will all agree with, with that sentiment. Um, I think there is a memorial service expected uh, in, in the near future. So anybody, of course, would wish to, to join that. We'll make sure the details are provided to you. But uh, I'm sorry to have lost uh, Alan and he was a he was a great colleague. So we begin, of course, by remembering Alan. Um, Stella, we wish uh, good health to as well. Stella's with us uh, in the hospital. Uh, it's she ha hasn't. Uh, she's fine. She, she's doing well, uh, and she hasn't asked for privacy in that matter. And uh, I share with you that uh, Stella's um, uh, doing perfectly well. She's still on the ward. I think been with us a couple of weeks. But uh, I heard from Jackie this morning. I hope you don't mind me mentioning Jackie that uh, you understood that she's in good spirits and. Uh, uh, in recovery. So I'm pleased to hear that. So obviously we wish Stella all the best and look forward to seeing her back with us and face to face as soon as we can, please. But uh, there, there are other reasons why that's not possible at the moment, of course. OK, we note uh, our apologies from Dermot, uh, from the governor. And I did explain to um, uh, governor colleagues that uh, Barry Senior and our new non-exec director, Sugra, uh, are unable to join us today. So we do note them. Uh, we should note uh, Mel's uh, apologies as CEO. She would wish to be here. There are some personal reasons why Mel can't join us today. Happy ones, I think. Um, so, so understood there. Uh, but that's the apologies to note. David, would you like to come in, please? Yeah, I think there's, there's apologies for me, Barah Hussain, as well. Oh, the, yes, you're right. Thank yeah. you very much, David. Yeah, yeah, I did receive those. So thank you for that. Yeah. And I can see that uh, Anne's joining us now as well. That's great. That's lovely. Good afternoon, Anne. Nice to have you with us. I think you can hear me fine. Yeah, that's good. OK, so we know those apologies. Thank you for that additional one, David. You're quite right. Uh, Ibra had told us uh, earlier today. Uh, declarations of interest, they're simply there to note, of course, and we, uh, we, we, we do update those regularly. And uh, it's incumbent on me to remind you, please, that uh, if a matter of interest arises during the course of any of the agenda items, you will please um, raise it with us. So let's do that. OK, given that we've got a short time with our uh, executive colleagues just for, for this uh, occasion, shall we turn to them in the first place? The courteous thing to do, of course, is to uh, turn to the, uh, the person representing uh, the CEO in the first place and maybe ask John if there was anything uh, John would wish to bring to our attention. Uh, and one specific thing, John, that arose during the course of the uh, earlier discussions with that was our relationship with TNA. Um, so I don't know whether, David, would you wish to articulate what it is you were thinking about our relationship with the press, just to, uh, so John knows? Um, well, it was uh, Adrian who, who raised the, the question, so maybe Adrian would like to, if that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He's a lifelong Bradfordian and a keen TNA reader. <laughs> I know it's, uh, there's some suggestion its readership's not very high at the moment, but um, uh, we had a quarterly meeting earlier on in January, and it's, it, it was reasonably positive, of course, with a lot of issues about around COVID and things. And then I walked to the other room and read a very negative um, uh, article, front page in the TNA, and I just wondered if 
um, we had any influence or link to its reporting or there was um, no relationship at all with them and, or did we see them as a as a useful tool to communicate with its readership? Thank you, Adrian. That, that's very well put and I'll ask John to cover that as he might talk to us. But uh, John, shall I turn to you first and ask us, uh, in representation of the CEO, anything you'd like to bring to the Governor's attention, please? Yeah, thanks for that, Max. So I wasn't going to do any kind of uh, Mel's CEO address. I don't think there's really enough time. And actually, you've got Pat and you've got Karen here today. And I think they're both bang on the money in terms of what's keeping us busy at the moment and what's top of our kind of immediate concerns, both in respect of the need to get all of our staff vaccinated and this imminent deadline for, for that and in terms of the operational and clinical pressures we're under at the moment. You know, if you read the headlines in some of the newspapers, Omicron is, you know, neither here nor there. We can all take our masks off and, you know, go down the pub. Whereas the reality when you're running an acute hospital is it's a lot more complicated than that. It's a lot more difficult than that. We have staffing issues and we have operational issues. So, and Pat and Karen are both uh, better qualified than I am to talk about those issues respectively. And, and I'll leave it to them. I think if Mel were here, she'd just want to say she's incredibly proud of the efforts of our workforce. I know we say this a lot. I don't think we can say it enough. It's nearly two years now. I think people are very tired. You know, a second COVID Christmas was a huge ask of a workforce that's really, you know, gone the extra mile. One of the discussions we were having the other day in our executive team meeting was about the rules around leave carry forward. We've got people with huge amounts of leave backed up because they just haven't taken it. You know, and 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 we shouldn't underestimate the the burden it places on our people and the stuff they do. And uh, yes, we do recognise that and say thank you. And we try and get out and about to um, see them individually and and uh, express our thanks. But it's but it's been really tough for them. And I think that will come across as 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 Pat and Karen talk about the things they want to talk about. In respect of the media and the TNA, I mean, we could <laughs> we could probably run a whole seminar on that. Print media, especially local print media, is is kind of dying on its feet. And I think what we're looking at is a slow decline, which may even be accelerating. And I'm afraid it's truer now than it's ever been that bad news sells stories. So if they can say something scary and dramatic on the front page, it's probably more interesting than a than a good news story. I'm not picking on the TNA. All local media is like that. We do our best to have a relationship with the TNA because they are our local newspaper and they do have a loyal readership locally. But it's actually not run out of Bradford. It's a kind of regional thing. I think the HQ is actually in North Wales and they run print publications across the north of the country. So it's not like the old days where you could go and you know have a coffee with the editor and talk things through and invite them in to have a wander around. It's really difficult. So it was actually a bit of a coup for us that before Christmas, we managed to get Felicity McNamara, who's the, the lead correspondent for most stuff we do, to come in and sit down with Mel. And off the back of that, uh, Felicity, the TNA have run three or four stories, which actually, this will sound a bit condescending, but have been really quite insightful and uh, sensitive to what it's like. We're delighted about that. So I don't disagree with anything you've said, Adrian, but actually, on balance, I, th I think we're... Um, I think we're slightly ahead of where we might otherwise have been, but there will always be those headlines. It is incredibly frustrating. And, uh, you know, I think we've just got to accept that's because it's what sells newspapers. We do our best. The comms team are all over it. Um, Prince having a hard time. They're, they're, they're bound to say salacious stuff because it, you know, it sells, sells copies. That, that's what I said in the other meeting. <laughs> bad, new, bad news sells. And I have seen the other positive stuff as well. They tend to be on page five rather than at the front. But um, I, I have read that and that there is some good stuff going on at the moment. But yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. I, I'll, I'll assume from that you're content with what you heard. Oh, from yeah, John. Okay. So, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Th thanks very much, John. So uh, I'll turn to, to Karen now then, thanks. And uh, Karen, uh, I know you're going to take us uh, through uh, the the briefly I know, but uh, the, the current um, operational situation. Um, there were some issues arose, Karen. Hopefully, this will be no surprise to you. Uh, during the course of the the pre discussion, uh, there were some interesting points about um, if if Omicron is 
allegedly a milder variant in terms of the potential illness, well, why might that still be having the effect on our uh, ability to conduct um, business as, as normal? So that was one of the things that was mentioned. Uh, the, um, the inpatient survey analysis, uh, governors are really keen to hear how we're going with that. We realise there's some repeated themes. I know it's something that quite properly on this occasion has been dropped from this agenda. But if you're able to touch on that at all, uh, Karen, that would be extremely helpful. Uh, and then there was another issue about um, value for money in the independent sector. It, Karen, that may have been an impossible question to, to answer uh, just off the cuff sort of thing at this meeting. But very good points were raised about how do we seek uh, assurance that we're getting the optimal services in the independent sector and value from money for, for that. Of course, those matters were, were answered by non-executive colleagues uh, as best we could, but fair to, uh, to bring it here and just see if you would wish to say anything about that. Um, but otherwise, I don't think I've missed anything else that uh, arose in the discussions, Karen, and I'll perhaps turn to you and invite you to tell us about um, operational pressures and uh, just where we are at the moment, please, Karen. Thanks, Max. So those three points that you've raised actually fit into my three buckets that I'm going to talk to you about. So I'm yeah. going to talk about our current position with COVID and winter. I'm going to talk to you about where we're up to with restart, with reconfiguration, and then I'm going to talk to you a bit about um, the quality, the patient experience and the patient um, safety aspect of things as well. So um, I'll rattle through and feel free to ask questions at the end. Yeah. So the current COVID position over the last week is um, we've got between 95 and 110 patients that are COVID positive in the bed base. What that means is that that's three wards um, that are, have got COVID patients in. Now, yes, the Omicron variant, you'll have heard it, you know, it's nothing more than a cold. Well, it might be nothing more than a cold if you've not got an underlying condition, if you're not having major surgery, um, if you're not frail and elderly, um, and if you're not, and if, um, and also if you're not um, triple vaccinated. So we know that if you are triple vaccinated, you can still catch Omicron, you can probably still uh, pass it on. But the likelihood of you becoming very seriously ill with a COVID infection when you've been uh, triple vaccinated, if you've got no under, other underlying health conditions, are very small. And what we're seeing is in our numbers of the COVID patients that are admitted now, so of the 97 patients that were in our beds as of two hours ago, roughly a third of those will be in with COVID and respiratory things. The other two thirds may have well come in with a stroke, a cardiac condition, a surgical condition, generally unwell, sepsis. So they'll have something else going on. But because the levels of Omicron and the variants are so prevalent in society at the moment, the likelihood is that something like, you know, as obvious last week in Bradford, it was something like 20% of the people could have Omicron at any given time. So the likelihood is that people coming into hospital will have the virus as well. So you might think, well, it's just a bit of a cold. It's not going to impact on people. So why we have to still maintain strict isolation, managing what we call pop-ups, if somebody becomes positive while they're in hospital, and keeping um, COVID patients separate is because if we were to mix and not to swap people for COVID, and they were next to somebody who had major surgery and that person then got passed on the infection, you are twice as likely to die as a result of your surgery if you catch COVID. And also, you know, if you've got other things going on, like you've had a stroke or you're a COPD patient or you're a cancer patient and you're immunosuppressed, to catch a COVID infection, just like similar if they were to catch a cold or the flu, would be really devastating. And because there's so much of the, the COVID about, that's why it's severely impacting on the way we bring patients in and the way we're operating at the moment. The positive news is, and, and this is because, you know, because of the vaccine, you know, 80% of the country has been vaccinated, which is tremendous. I never thought we'd get there at all. Um, so we know that we've lessened the effects because of that. So what we can see is that the patients that are requiring non-invasive ventilation or treatment on our intensive care units are much less. 
So at the time at the beginning when we had 100 patients in, there was probably between about 25 and 35 patients. So a quarter to a third of the patients would have required some sort of non-invasive ventilation or ventilation on our intensive care unit. Those numbers are now very small. So as of today, we've got, like I said, 97, so 100 patients for ease of numbers, four of which are requiring non-invasive ventilation. So that's, you know, people are getting much better outcomes and that's good. It means they're not as sick. What we do know is that COVID will go through a certain pattern. So we see um, a spike in infection in the community, which we believe was about two weeks ago. We then see a week later, a spike in hospital attendances and hospital admissions, which we believe was about over the last week. So two weeks ago, spike in the community, a week ago, spike in hospital admissions. And this week, we would expect to see that slight spike in people that are at the sicker end. So when I look at the figures, there's a couple of things that I look at to tell me, are those patients sicker this week than they were last week? And it's the oxygen usage, whether or not they're on non-invasive ventilation and whether there's people on intensive care. And I know that this week, my oxygen usage is 220 litres over the COVID ward, which last week it was about 100. So that's doubled. So there's more people requiring more oxygen. And there's four people having non-invasive ventilation instead of one. So there's four times as many people requiring non-invasive ventilation, which means it's still doing that same pattern as it's always done, but the numbers are less and the numbers are less serious, which is really positive. In addition to that, of course, we've got people turning up with the normal winter pressures and the normal things. And, um, you know, again, people turning up because they can't get into the GP. We know that that's nobody's fault. We just know that with the amount of work that's happening in the system at the moment, it's really difficult to manage that capacity and manage that demand. So numbers attending A&E, we've seen a steady rise. So it can be anything from 350 to 450 people. Around about 70 to 80% of those people will get seen within four hours. And you'll remember that four hours was the standard. What we have seen over the last few weeks, though, is that we have um, increasing numbers of people who um, are at the lower priority for triage. So they're not the sickest people, they can wait. Where you'd normally expect to see them within two hours, they can be waiting in excess of six, seven, eight or nine hours. So there's been some incredibly long waits in A&E. And that's because of the way that we've been managing people through in the sicker end of the people. Not necessarily COVID, your general sort of strokes, cardiac conditions that come in during this time. Combined with that, of course, is so if 20% of people have got COVID, and, and this wave, I've known more people with COVID than I've ever known with COVID, um, that, that impacts on your staff as well and your staff's ability to come to work because they might be poorly themselves or looking after somebody or they might have been in contact with a close family member. So that brings with it staffing issues as well. And we know that when staffing numbers are not what they should be, the bits of the quality of care that goes are that patient experience. So the waiting times in A&E will go up, the waiting times to see a doctor will go up. Um, the, the times, how long it takes you to answer a form, to sit with the patient and do those extra bits just won't happen because you're focused on keeping people safe. But I'll touch on that in a bit. So that's where we're up to sort of operational. If we then think, actually, but we're going to restart and we're going to get out of this and we're going to recover. So we currently have three COVID wards. The intention that that will be down to two within the next two weeks. So we'll just have the two COVID wards, which are the ones we've had all, all along. <clears throat> what we've got happening, hopefully, at the end of next week, which is really exciting and allows us to really ramp up our elective process, is that um, the development we've been doing on Ward 2 and 5, to turn that into our surgical admissions unit for emergency patients, will be complete. <coughs> Excuse me. That allows us to move the existing Ward 20 and 21 from the opposite end of the hospital down towards A&E so at that bottom end of the hospital we'll have all the emergency services there together with better floor, better facilities. I've seen some pictures of it this morning, it looks fab. More sidewalls, more privacy, much better environment. 
that also then allows us to free up some estates, which is the old ward 20 and 21. And that will enable us to do more elective work. Because whilst we're dealing with the emergency patients, and that is taking up the bed base and the time and the effort, we cannot be operating on the people that require surgery. So you'll be aware, and you hear us talking about P1, P2 and P3s. So P1 is emergency, absolutely has to have it. Your P2s are your urgents and your cancers. Your P3s might be something like somebody waiting for a hip operation. And your P4s might be something that's nice to have, but actually it doesn't matter when you have it. It's not going to get any worse. So we know we've got lots of people nationally. There's lots of people that maybe got listed for a hip replacement or a knee replacement two years ago that still haven't had that. Now, it might have not been an urgency at the time to save the life and still might not be an urgency to save the life. But there is something about the quality of life of these people. And what we want to be able to do is to intervene so that these people can go on and have a good quality of life. So we are absolutely focused on opening up more capacity so we can restart our elective surgery programme and our elective orthopaedic programme. So very quickly in this quarter, we're going to see 20 and 21 open for elective surgery, including more day case capacity. And we're going to see Ward 14 open to for elective orthopaedics and we've not done elective orthopaedics on this site for well almost two years now and that'll be a, a huge bonus to everybody and, and actually all the staff are really excited that we'll be able to do that again if you then go forward again to a future state as we tap, start to drop things down there's some other exciting things going to be happening over the next few months as well so Ward 11 is going to also open as additional capacity. That will probably be in April. And that will allow us to have a, a one or two day elective surgical bed base to allow us again to get lots of numbers through that. And that will help us bring those waiting times down and get a better experience for our patients. And we're also looking at opening a medical day case unit. So traditionally, for example, if you were to come in through A&E, and um, you had, say, a low haemoglobin, a low blood count, you would um, be admitted to the medical admissions unit, you'd stay in, they'd do some tests, and you'd have a blood transfusion the next day. What the medical day case unit allows you to do is to say, actually, you need blood transfusion, well, we're going to send you home, and it's absolutely fine for you to come in. Oh, next Wednesday, you'll arrive, purpose facility, get your blood transfusion and be able to go home. Much better plan, happens in a timely way, much more safe. So that's a bit about the future state and where we're going with the restart programme. If we then touch on the sort of what I'm calling the, the quality bits of things. Um, so patient experience, you've seen the inpatient survey. So um, again, after doing so well the year before, so coming from a place of not a great inpatient survey a few years ago, we did a lot of work around good night sleep tight and other things and really improved things the time before. And then um, this survey has come out and to say I was a bit sick as a chip would, would be an understatement, but no more sicker than the chip about the poor patients that have had to undergo some of those experiences. But after I got over myself, I, I looked at it and I looked at um, other trusts in our area. So the sample, how it's taken. So they start off on a certain day of the month and they work through until they get 1,200 patients. Um, and then they all get the questionnaire. So at the time that the sample was taken, as a trusted in West Yorkshire, we were doing very little elective patients. And elective patients always give a better feedback than a non-elective patient. That's a a national thing and we still had very very high numbers of COVID in our bed base if you went further south than Birmingham they did not have high numbers of COVID at that time and when we were having our second wave London hadn't even started a second wave at that time and when the country went into second wave we were actually having our third wave so there are reasons why experience was impacted at that time but there are many things we can learn from that, including learning from COVID. So one is the food, and that came through in both inpatient survey uh, for children and for adults. Um, the second is about how we have conversations with people, whether that be a nurse or a doctor, 
and how we have conversations with relatives. Now, I think there's something linked there to visiting as well and how we manage that whole experience. But I think there's also something about how we engage with our community. And some of you will be aware, because I think some of you have joined the engagement meeting, that I've set up an engagement meeting with people of the wider community to really try and understand why the BRI, as it say, you know, the BRI has a bad press. Because until we start to dispel those myths, we could have the most perfect services in the world, but people will still say, oh yeah, well, when my uncle, auntie, some brother, it was terrible on this. So there's something to do on our public image as well. So there's lots to do. Um, saying that, you know, are we giving the best patient experience at the moment? We're probably not, because we only have probably on most of the wards, half of the staff that we would normally have. That doesn't mean that it's not safe, but it does mean that things will be delayed, the experience that people have will not be as good as it should be. And that's a bit about the workforce challenge, and we're working through that, and Pat will pick up on that a little bit more with that as well. The other big piece of news is, I'm on my last two points now, Max, should be pleased to know, the other big piece of news is all the work that we've been doing around the outstanding maternity services is really starting to come to fruition. So if we, um, and I'm talking calendar years now, so if we look at the calendar year 2019 and I look at one metric, which is stillbirth, so babies born, um, babies that die in utero, um, we had 46 stillbirths for the year 2019. In 2020, we had 35 stillbirths and sorry, 36 stillbirths, and last year, 2022, we had 25 stillbirths. So we have had the stillbirth rate in, in three years. Now, one swallow does not make a summer, or whatever the phrase is, but all of the improvement work that has gone in, including introducing things like customised growth charts, um, looking at the workforce, redefining roles, and the whole outstanding programme is really becoming to pay off. And I think we've got a maternity service that we should all be proud of now. And key to that has been actually working with our community through the Maternity Voices Partnership. And if we can replicate that model with the rest of our services, I think we will get that one step further to creating really high quality services. My final point is, um, and John touched on it as well, he said if Mel was here, he would be saying, um, she would be saying thank you. Um, I am incredibly proud to be the chief nurse here at Bradford Teaching Hospital. Our staff have gone above and beyond. Um, they have worked in conditions um, that I never thought we would have to work in, and they've delivered care to the best of their ability. And within that, they've delivered outstanding care at times as well. And I, I really think we should recognise that and thank them because they really have gone above and beyond. And I will pause there for questions. That's fantastic, Karen. That's that's real hands-on insight. Thank you very much indeed. Extremely useful. Uh, Karen, one of the um, uh, issues that was the, the uh, questions that was raised earlier with us was an interest in the inpatient survey, and we're grateful. Uh, I think the intention is to ha have some proper time on that, isn't it? Maybe the next um, Council of Governors that we think about the actions we're taking, etc. Uh, direction of travel. Um, there was a question raised about whether we ever seek to segment uh, the data by, for example, ethnicity or age or gender. Or um, do, do we ever try to do that to see if there are particular cohorts of patients experiencing in, in different ways? Yeah, we, we, we have it cut by all of those things. So we have all demographic um, data apart from when it smalls, uh, falls into small numbers. So we have that demographic data, I can go into it in more detail. But the one big thing where we were different and the other West Yorkshire Trust were different as well, is that um, I think it was something like 85% of patients had come in on emergency medical pathways, so it was a very high number. And normally you see more people coming in on surgical pathways or elective pathways. And that cohort just wasn't in the this time. Thank you. Th thanks, guys. It's good to know that that's there. And maybe if we can touch on that as we do a bit of a briefing uh, for Governor subsequently, that'd be helpful. Um, Alistair, I think you raised that point at first, but would you like to come in? Yeah, uh, quick question, if you may. Thank you very much, Karen. Um, just 
obviously we, we all understand why staffing levels are extremely challenged and so on and <clears throat> you made the point as others did earlier that but it's safe i just though is there a risk of it becoming sort of unsafe suddenly in any particular pocket if you've got enough capacity to move people around if you know i i'll just make this up you know if one ward got three staff COVID cases tomorrow have you, you got a load of patients in bed and no nurses or... um, that, that's exactly what we do on an hour by hour uh, basis hour by hour. <laughs> so um, we never look at staffing in isolation to one ward so we have at any one time 24-7 um, senior nurse cover um, that is focused on the flow of patients and staffing during the hours of seven in the morning till nine at night, there's an additional senior nurse cover on that just focuses on staffing. And that's about moving staff. And we have a tool that allows us to look at the um, sickness of the patients by ward and comes up with a score. So we can risk assess where the staff are needed the most mm. and move staff accordingly. Yeah. And that's what we do sometimes on an hour by hour basis. Yeah, that's keeping you pretty busy then. Yeah. And, and if, if I may quickly, Max, I did have sure. a question for John. Um, yeah, it's, sure. uh, again, it's a very quick one, John. You, you mentioned that there was a discussion about whether or not leave should be carried over, but then you didn't say what the result of that discussion was. Well, you've got the director of HR here if you want the definitive answer, but the short answer is yes. I mean, there are already arrangements in place. We we pretty much ripped up the rules last year on carrying over leave. The same mm -hmm. rules still apply, although we are looking to contract it a bit because otherwise it just grows and grows. Yeah, so I yeah. think this year the, the working number is something like a 15 day carryover maximum, which is more than we would normally allow without exceptional circumstances. But right. everything's exceptional this year. Pat can correct me if I'm wrong. Sorry, Pat, I should have yeah. asked you. I realised you come in, Pat. Yeah, you come in. Did that sound nice? <laughs> Okay. So, yeah, that, that's that's broadly right. Look, the government introduced a new statutory rule as a result of COVID pressures at the end of 2020, which meant that um, which meant that workers who were prevented from taking annual leave due to COVID-related work pressures could carry over 20 days over a two-year period. So that that is also sort of in the background in terms of our policy. And, and and so should they should they actually get to want to take it? Obviously, that's going to create further challenges in terms of staffing levels. So I, I'm, I suppose you've got some sort of how far ahead do they need to book it? Do they have to book it far ahead? Um, yeah, look, each department have their own rules around um, annual around annual leave booking. How you know how how many days someone can have off at a time? So it is sort of managed at departmental level. Okay, thanks. Oh, great stuff, Alistair. Yeah, great questions. And of course, Amanda Pritchard is quoted as saying that rest and recovery are part of your terms and conditions. So, you know, she's keen, isn't she, to promote the idea that you take your rest when you can. Karen, would you like to come back in? Yeah, it was just to say um, I missed on the value for money. So um, I think there was two parts of that question. One was, is the independent sector value for money? And one is, is what's the quality of service like and how do we know? So I can answer part of that, but you probably need somebody like uh, Matthew in the room for the value for money bit. But I know something Wizzy has done. So the quality, so um, I'll give an example. So we were using a independent provider for endoscopy at the start of COVID. Um, we sent uh, a number of patients there and we had a number of complaints in short session, short succession about the quality of care within that provider. We immediately stopped using the provider, went and inspected the premises, discussed with the provider the concerns that we had. They weren't able to rectify those and we actually withdrew the contract then from that provider. So we have a duty as the NHS Trust if we subcontract any services to another provider to make sure that the quality of care that our patients receive is what we would expect them to receive. We actually went one step further and also discussed this with the CQC who then took up and looked into the issues with the independent provider as well. So there is a very definite loop between us being able to monitor the services of people who provide services for us. 
that's very well put, Karen. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Ruth, if uh, assuming you can hear me OK, um, you, you were very articulate in your interest on the value for money question. And it may be unfair to expect an executive colleague to answer that in full at the moment. Um, but I'm, so we could perhaps produce just a short briefing for governors. Would, would you like to articulate the point that you thought was of interest to governors, Ruth? Uh, I'm not sure if I could articulate as well again. Um, <laughs> I'll try. It's just around value for money and insourcing and are we confident that we are getting value for money in the... Um, it is true value for money and it is being sourced um, and reducing backlogs where necessary uh, because we know that a lot of insourcing, there's a lot of procedures that they can't cover or deal with. So from uh, one specialty point of view, they may not be able to, to be able to um, get value for money from that source, but others do. And that, is it true value for money? in that you know it, it's hard to so you know are we getting the patients through that we thought we were getting through and is it cost effective yeah yeah and, and Ruth I think I remember you gave a good example didn't you of where could you go to the independent sector in certain areas that might improve our overall performance, might yeah. support other areas of the, the trust. So that was well put as well. But yeah. no, no, thank, thank you, Ruth. I, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. I'm, I'm keen that we get the information to you uh -huh. that you're, you're seeking. Um, I think Karen's going to come back in there, but it may be that we could just have a, a very short briefing produce or something to circulate to governors. But I, because I, I did take the spirit that you supported the use of the independent sector where necessary to most definitely yeah, yeah yeah yes thank you ruth yeah karen would you like to come back in thank you yeah so um I, i'm obviously ruth wears two hats um as a, as a manager within the trust and as on the council of governors as well so so i think it is right that we get sad or matthew to bring a brief in to the next council of governors but also i just wonder if ruth um could also have a conversation with Saj outside of this meeting to explain further her concerns on a one-to-one. On -one. You may already have done that, Ruth, but um, that might be sensible as well. Yeah, yeah, most definitely. I don't think it's majorly concerns. It's just confidence in that we are getting value for money as a trust from the independent sectors that, and, you know, from patient experience point of view, not just monetary as well. Yeah. Perfect, perfectly put and, and perfectly fair uh, uh, question. Thank you, Ruth. Yeah, and so let's raise the action that we will uh, determine the best way to inform governors of the way in which we seek value for money from use of the independent sector. And we'll decide the best way to do that, whether it's a briefing to council of governors or whether it's maybe a short briefing out to you, then, then that's great. OK, I am conscious that, uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> John, I've just got a note from you regarding the 4.30 uh, goal meeting that you have yeah so I'll move to to Pat now shall I but I do respect the fact that uh, uh, John Gavin and Pat will have to leave us fairly soon so let's let's hear from Pat Pat I know that there was a couple of particular interests in um, vaccination as a condition of, of deployment and uh, what that's about and uh, take up of counselling service was also two of the additional issues um, but Pat shall I bring you in for anything you would like to bring to governor's attention please yeah, sure. So, um, so I suppose in terms of our sort of available workforce, um, we continue to see sort of high sickness absence rates. Um, we, in terms of yesterday, for example, we're still at 572 staff absences, of which sort of two, 232 were COVID cases. So that that was down about uh, probably about 40 in the previous week. Um, but we are seeing a a small decline in sickness rather than sort of a very sort of steep decline that we saw sort of in previous um, in previous episodes. Um, year to date, our year to date sickness is running at about 6.42%. Um, and in terms of sort of the um, our, our top two reasons for sickness, um, anxiety, stress, depression, mental health conditions is our top reason for absence at 25% of all absence days, followed by infectious disease, which is all the COVID related absence at, um, at 16%. Um, 
anxiety stress is is the sort of has been the sort of highest reason for absence for um for some time and is consistent with sort of other acute trusts um, and I think when we think about the available workforce, it's not just sickness. So, for example, we have, you know, around 130, 140 people on maternity leave at any one time. Um, and we also have sort of short notice, no, short notice carers leave, particularly again, um, atta attached at the minute to um, implications of COVID positive cases in children, leading obviously to um, childcare issues. Um, and, and again, our vacancies on top of that, which shows pretty much as Karen says, it often on a day to day basis is a juggling act um, in terms of staff. Um, in terms of, I know, um, I know the council of governors were interested in, in sort of take up of, of counselling, etc. Um, so we have, um, uh, we have an, e an employee assistance programme provider called CIC. The um, latest data that we got for the, from them was um, between sort of November and December last year, there were 123 contacts made to that service. 70% uh, of calls were for sort of what they call in the moment emotional support. Um, and then 28% of those were referred for structured counselling support, uh, which we, um, as part of the standard contract, we give six sessions of counselling. And then about 2% were referred on to external um, support agencies. Um, in, in, terms of, in terms of numbers to that service, there were sort of um, 28 there were 28 staff re referred to counselling through that service in the sort of the last quarter of that year. Um, and whilst the sort of the contacts to the service may not seem high when you think of our overall workforce, um, we are actually, our usage is actually slight, slightly higher than other NHS trusts who use the service. Um, alongside that, we also have the uh, ICS West Yorkshire Health and Wellbeing Hub, which offers sort of therapy serv services, again primarily on a self referral basis. Um, but again, interestingly, the Bradford referrals into that service were a lot lower than the Leeds Leeds referrals. So out of sort of three hundred and twenty five referrals they've had to that service since it opened, 51% have been from the Leeds district and 17% have been from the Bradford district. So obviously we're reviewing in terms of whether there are any sort of barriers to access um, to, that, to that service, because then again, the majority of contacts are online. You know, they're not, they're not sort of um, uh, face to face. Um, alongside that, we now have, we have obviously have a staff psychologist attack based in occupational health, who has seen people on an individual referral basis. Um, and we now have a CBT therapist. So bo both those people have caseloads and we have a psychologist based in um, the main psychology department who does quite a lot of outreach services to wards and departments and again has a small caseload. So we have sort of very much sort of bolstered our offer um, around um, around sort of mental health support services um, in the last 12 months and will sort of continue continue to do so. Um, in terms in terms of fee card um, mandatory vaccination, which is sort of taking most of our time at the moment. Um, obviously, the regu regulations take effect from the 1st of April 2022. Um, I've been on sort of two meetings today where um, the message has been clearly given that there is no indication of a change in direction um, and that the plan our planning assumptions should that should be that um, that this will happen. Uh, so that is sort of the because some of you may know this there was a lot of speculation in the in the media over the weekend. Um, but that's that is what uh, what has come out today. So regulations take effect from 1st of April. There is a 12 week grace period, which means that all in scope workers 
need to have their first vaccination by the 3rd of February 2022. Um, the definition of in scope is is broad. So it's it's not just uh, it's not just people involved in you know direct face to face patient care activities. It is uh, it does include people in uh, both clinical and non clinical roles who may have social contact or incidental contact with patients, and that's what sort of very much widens the scope um, of the regulations. And obviously, it is linked to those um, uh, who provide. Uh, CQC regulated activities. Uh, we have had, um, as everybody has, a big sort of data challenge in terms of the systems available to us uh, to record vaccinations, um, particularly where people have been vaccinated off site. Um, our latest national data uh, showed that, told us that 95% of our staff have had a first vaccine and 91% of our staff have had a second vaccine, with, from our records, around 450 staff um, actually unknown or unvaccinated. We've just actually run um, a lot of new reports today um, because there's been a lot of validation work, a lot of one-to-one -one meetings held over the last couple of weeks. Um, and we're currently at around 300 substantive staff who have not had their first, first vaccination. Um, we have sent out sort of formal review letters um, to all those people who we have had no record of a first vaccination dose. Um, and sort of certainly this week and next week, I've got sort of a wide range of sort of one to one meeting offers with all those staff. Um, we are sort of starting to identify some potential sort of high risk areas where, where we have clusters of staff who are um, quite firmly declining vaccination. Um, and we're sort of working through that uh, with Karen and the uh, directors of OPS. Um, it is, um, I think it, it is a difficult time for everyone. I think emotions are quite high around um, around this legislation, um, but it, it is something that we obviously have to, you know, we have to comply with. And so we have we have put in a lot of resources into um, engagement events with staff, um, sessions on particular topics. Um, um, our clinicians have been great in terms of both sort of leading engagement events on uh, topics of interest and also being prepared to take to have one to one discussions with people. Uh, so it is an ongoing process and obviously even past the 3rd of February, we will still be working on encouraging um, as many people to be vaccinated as possible. Uh, that's extremely useful. Thank you. Pat, may I ask if we could just keep you for five minutes, uh, just so that people can reflect on, on, on the people issues. I, I know that our executive colleagues have a fourth. Am I right there, John? There's a 4.30 gold meeting. Uh, Pat, yes, would it be exactly. okay if you joined that just very slightly late, just to allow yes. people to take in? Yeah. Uh, and, and it also reflects the importance of workforce to us all. So, uh, Karen and John, thank you so much. May I just check quickly, were there any final questions just for Karen or John that hadn't been asked? Of course, non-executive colleagues will pick up as well if necessary. So shall we shall we let Karen and John get to the, the gold meeting, which is to do with obviously COVID operational response. And uh, perhaps John, you just advise uh, gold colleagues that Pat will be with you, with, uh, with you in five or six minutes. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. But sincere appreciation for giving up your time uh, to, to come and join us. It's much appreciated. Thank you. Camden John, thanks. And as ever, this yeah, the meeting is not the only form of engagement, of course. We will welcome questions and comments. So thank you to Kevin and John. Pat, thank you so much for just staying for just a few minutes, um, just to allow people to take in uh, what they were hearing there. Um, one of the things I know that was raised of interest to governors, um, Pat, and there, there was no... Um, opinions expressed on this particularly, but just the issue of um, de uh, redeployment and, of course, possible dismissal. And there was just an interest in that. And uh, I think we articulated our position correctly that we 
we, we reserve the right to, to redeploy and to dismiss if, if it comes to that. Um, but just wondered if you had any uh, further um, thoughts on that, on, on our, our own stra strategy view of, of that, is whether you'd wish to share any of uh, your thoughts with that, please. OK, so so we have been clear to, clear to staff that we will try to redeploy wherever possible, but that we will have limited redeployment opportunities available to staff. And that is very much because of the scope of the regulations. So we, d we do see redeployment opportunities as being limited. We, we are, however, sort of looking at people's jobs to see whether, and again, it is something, you know, we do need to do. So we need to look at redeployment. We then need to look at whether somebody, someone's job can be adjusted to enable them to continue at work. So, you know, and there was an example today of sort of, you know, 90% of someone's role was working remotely. Perhaps one clinic a week was working in the hospital. So it's that sort of example where you would look to see whether you could readjust those duties to enable someone to stay in work. Great example. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pat. Yeah, that's a great example. Sorry if I'm interrupting yeah, yeah. you. No, that's fine. But I think ultimately we do have to recognise that if if the numbers stay the same and like we have about 70, 70 formal declines so far, um, you know, there will be um you know there will be a consider considerable number of dismissals yeah yeah and, and i think that's what governors wanted uh, some insight on that so thank you very much and uh, really helpful so i'll open up for any questions or thoughts uh with pat that anybody would like to to raise please and i'm grateful to pat for holding on with us uh, alistair would you like to come on please yeah thank, thanks pat uh obviously any dismissal is you know unpleasant and we don't want it to happen can you just remind me, 70 is what sort of proportion? I presume this is, mo I know it's not all nursing, is it? I know there's some radiologists, pop I don't know if they're in that 70 or not, but I know there's, but sort of what what's the size of the workforce that 70 will be coming out of? Oh, so, so at the minute it's around 300. First, people who haven't had the first dose. So it, it very much depends. So our, our, risk, our risk areas at the minute are radiography, where we have a high proportion of the workforce um, unvaccinated, our facilities workforce, so particularly domestic, ward, hospitality and security, um, and healthcare assistance as a group, um, which obviously we need to get into more granular detail in terms of whether there's whether there's, there's going to be a particular problem on a particular ward or service area. Yeah, that, that's what I was wondering. So, so it yeah. could... So they are very clumped. So it, there is a risk it could put a service at risk. Sorry, double risking there. Yes, yeah, and that, that's the work we're doing at the moment yeah. and asking service areas to do risk assessments, et cetera. And, and really quickly, I suppose it's not that important, but do other hospitals have the same pattern? Is it the same disciplines in other hospitals? Um, interestingly, radiography is the same across West Yorkshire for some reason. We, we don't know why. <laughs> So, so if you find the right person to flip, you can probably flip them all. I know. Yeah, we don't know why. Um, and healthcare assistance does seem to be um, uh, does seem to be an at-risk group across across the wider patch, actually across Yorkshire and Humber. Right. And then different some some trusts are having a big issue with midwives, for example. So, yeah. But the nurses have flipped then because I think for a while there were concerns about the nurses and um, the numbers of unvaccinated nurses have come down but in particular specialty areas there, would st there are still pockets thank you Th thank you Alistair yeah yeah and uh, Alistair raised in the uh, the pre-session actually Pat the issue of um, how we're assessing the potential impact of any redeployment stroke dismissals uh, in clinical areas uh, you, you described that, but could I just check with you, who, who's who's leading that? Who's collating that all together? So the risk side, so I suppose I'm managing the HR process side and then Karen's managing the risk side right. uh, with, with the directors of ops and the, the CBU general managers. Yeah, 
Great stuff. That's so that's very helpful. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, and I'll just see whether did anybody else have any other questions for Pat? It was a, 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 a in keeping with the uh, with John and Cannon, it was a terrific briefing in terms of the key points, uh, and I think actually um, matched some of the issues that were raised uh, with us earlier for consideration yeah. today. So thank you. But you will still have Pat if there's any outstanding uh, questions. It would appear not. So I'll Pat, go quickly. <laughs> uh, yeah, quickly perhaps, but, uh, thanks very much for stopping on there and for the quality okay. of the briefing. And of course, you need to get into goal, don't you, to uh, be able to have your say on the, uh, the deployment issues there. So, okay. okay. Thanks very much. Thank you, Thank you. Cheers. Now. Yeah. Great stuff. Okay. Well, Obviously, apologies to, to Governor colleagues in terms of the time we, we had available with exec colleagues, but uh, it, they've given us a good hour of their time there, haven't they? And uh, I hope you found the information provided useful. As I keep uh, emphasising, Council of Governors is not the, the be-all and end-all, of course. It's an important uh, forum uh, and, and indeed a public forum. But, uh, you know, we, we welcome uh, queries, questions, supportive or otherwise uh, uh, being brought to our attention. So thank you. Shall we be a little transactional now in terms of some of the, um, the business on the meeting? That's not to diminish uh, any opportunity that uh, a governor would wish to take to inquire of something or ask for further detail. Of course not. But if we can get fairly transactional, we can get through the business here that we've, uh, we've got. Shall we begin by turning to Sugra in the hope that, yes, Sugra is here. So uh, Sugra had given her apologies, but has obviously been able to join us. And Sugra, what... What terrific opportunity should you wish to say hello to uh, the governors here at Council? So would you like to introduce yourself, Sugra? Hello, everyone. Yes, so uh, I was actually in St. Luke's and uh, finished up there sooner than I expected. Uh, and just to say that um, it was very well staffed and the clinic I attended was very well and efficiently run. So that that was good to see, given some of the staffing challenges that that we have at the moment. Uh, and also personally, I was quite pleased to see all the masks in evidence. Uh, quite reassuring to be on site with that. Yes, but yeah, thank you, everyone. I have met some of you before in person through my very rigorous selection process. Um, and I'm looking forward to working with you all in the coming months. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sugra. So um, Sugra obviously, obviously resisted the temptation to tell you all about herself and all her skills. But shall I just say as chairman that she's the perfect addition to our team? She, she brings some different uh, uh, skills and abilities, some fantastic community knowledge, uh, CQC experience, um, local politics, of course. So, you know, a really, really great addition to uh, to our team. And so we'll, we'll uh, uh, continue uh, improving the board of directors that we have. So great stuff, Sugra. Thank you very much indeed. Good to have you with us. Um, shall we deal with matters four and five, which are the minutes of our Council of Governors meeting on the 21st of October? Would anybody wish to bring to my attention any uh, amendments that are required or inaccuracies that ought to be uh, corrected? Um, Wendy, would you like to come in, please? Uh, yeah, thank you, Max. Very quick one um, on 10 uh, Governors uh, NRC Committee report. I would just um, had an update on the appointment of the Bradford University NED. I wondered which was that the Leeds University NED or was it the brief discussion we had about possibly having a Bradford University NED in addition? Lord, I could see you nodding there. Did you have the, the answer to that part, please? I probably need to check to confirm, to be honest, Max. Cause, yeah, um, yeah we, we did have the discussion, didn't we, around Bradford University. So yeah. we can double check that point and, and change it to Leeds if, if appropriate. But yeah. Um, yeah, maybe it just needs to be a bit clearer if it is Bradford that it's what happened. Yeah, yeah. Discussion. I was desperately yeah. trying to find it in the uh, <laughs> team engine there, Wendy. But you make the good point because if we're not if if we're not all absolutely clear as to what that refers to, then we'll just check the clarity of that. So Laura will take that away and ensure that it's uh, clear what that refers to. So uh, thank you, Laura. I'm glad you were on my screen there rather than just the uh, you know the initials. So that was helpful. Yeah, Wendy, thank you for your point. Yeah, 
And Anne, would, uh, can I bring you in, please? Good afternoon. Uh, sorry, I'm desperately trying to remember, but I, um, I think I, it seems like I've given my apologies for absence, but I think I was there for at least part of the meeting. OK, yeah, we can we will certainly check that, uh, Anne, and uh, if, if appropriate, of course, we'll amend that. Yes, thank you, Anne. Thank you very much. Yeah. OK, no other matters of inaccuracy. No, that's great. And there are five actions that arise from that. Um, four, very much. There you go. I've just had a, a cup of tea brought to me. How about that? That'll keep me going now, won't it? So I'm, I'm the lucky one there. You see, when you're chairing, you just can't disappear, can you? You've got to be here all the time. <laughs> so I've been looked after. Um, five actions arise. Uh, four of those are shown as complete. And I've got to take it uh, unless anybody wishes to raise anything that you are happy that those matters are dealt with. There was the um, correction, indeed, that uh, Tariq was indeed uh, in attendance in July. There was the sum of the pre-meeting, uh, which is the uh, asking to view the AGM and AM video and for feedback. Corporate strategy, which the survey link was indeed uh, recirculated among governors. And the fifth and final one there was the engagement policy. And uh, the amendment has been made that it should remain as a review every two years and not an annual review. So that's our engagement policy. So uh, unless anybody would wish to raise anything with me, I will endorse those as closed actions that have been completed to our satisfaction. And uh, there is just one outstanding uh, matter, which is uh, passionately held by me and I know by uh, non-executive colleagues, which is this, when can we get um, site visits uh, for governors uh, back on the go? Um, I resisted the temptation while John was here. John knows that I've been uh, on to him about this, about when can we get on with this. Of course we will at the earliest opportunity, but we're not there yet, let's be honest. We're not quite there yet. There is still, of course, no ban on any governor who has business, who chooses to come into the trust and undertake that business. But uh, in terms of actually organising site visits, we just need to be in a safer place before we can move to that. So the action is therefore on hold until the situation improves, but I promise you there is attention to that, okay? So unless, again, unless there's any uh, disagreement with that, I'll assume that you are content that the matters have been properly managed. Thanks very much. Um, at item six is the summary from the pre-meeting with the non-exec directors. May I suggest that I try to do that during the course of our discussions with um, executive officers. Uh, again, uh, Laura and her team will be happy to receive anything where just a little further detail is still required, if that's the case. But in the absence of anything desperately urgent now, may I suggest that those matters were indeed dealt with and I articulated them during the course of the discussions. And we said that we'd just turn to John. Um, and John, uh, you helpfully went to an NHS providers session on the health and care bill and you offered to give a... Um, uh, I think it was five minutes, so I'm going to say, can you get that to two minutes or two and a half minutes of the key points that you raised? But John, I should turn to you and say, what did you find interesting? Is there anything you'd wish to share with us, please? Thank you very much, Matt. Just before I start, just um, three quick points, really. It's a bit like the third coming, this, isn't it? We keep trying to get this briefing in, but for the third time of asking, we've got it in. <laughs> and I just wanted to prevail on my governor colleagues and just share with them at yesterday's Quality Academy, we did ask executive that they make sure our thanks as non-executive directors are passed on to staff for all the work they're doing now in the future and the challenges they've risen to. And I wouldn't want to be presumptuous, but I'm sure that uh, governors from this meeting may want to piggyback on that as well. We might as well uh, broaden it out. But that was just a suggestion, Max. Um, apologies for my camera being off. Technology is such that when I'm trying to read notes, you'd just see one eye if I had my camera on. So just bear with me. So okay. it's a very quick briefing from me on the presentation I went to two and a half weeks ago on the governor led, uh, sorry, on the NED led network for NEDs um, on a national briefing on the proposed health and social care bill. So things may have moved on in the last two and a half weeks. So this um, feedback is slightly old. So apologies if colleagues know more than me. This is the first GGI briefing I've been to. I thought it was excellent. I'd recommend them to people if they get the opportunity to access them. They were very knowledgeable. The only thing I was slightly surprised then is the first one I've been to was it was quite politically critical. And I know that's a bit of a national sport at the moment, but I was surprised perhaps it wasn't a little more neutral. That would be my general observation. Mm -hmm. Having said that, 
it was a very useful briefing and it set this proposed bill into context and it was very much about learning from the last 10 years of where the weaknesses are in our system, how we can address those and addressing some of the issues we're already working on, such as working as one and some of the issues about regional and joint working. I would just draw to your attention four specific points from this bill as it stands at the moment and before it becomes statute, there could be substantial changes. Um, the first one is that context thing about trying to undo what's happened in the past. The second one was a perceived risk from the NEDs who were doing the briefing for us of this being a potential power grab from the centre. So I'll leave you to judge for yourselves, but they were very keen that any of the amendments between uh, now and March or June, whenever it becomes a statute, tried to mitigate that risk, really. So that was the second point. Third point is the bill may uh, be very different from the uh, statute when it comes in, because there are at least 320 amendments being tabled, to my knowledge. So that's, that's quite a few, although some of them will be points of detail. And the main question that wasn't really clear, but I think is emerging now, is how um, integrated care boards will be set up, how they work and who will be part of them in terms of their role for the future. So it was a, that's a very distilled version of it, Max, but it gives people a flavour. You've got the formal and informal feedback I wrote, and I think Laura's got access to the formal feedback as well. So if anyone wants something more detailed, uh, those are the routes to get it. But uh, these type of briefings become highly recommended, and I'm fairly embarrassed it's the first one I've been to. Thank you. No, no, that, that's that's terrific, John. Thank you very much. And thanks for actually cutting to the chase in terms of the, the four key points that uh, you've noticed, uh, undoing the past, potential for power grab, all the amendments that uh, mean that we're still not sure if, if, what we've got and, and how, how that's going to change, and indeed the role of our integrated care boards. Yeah, Th thanks very much indeed for that, uh, John. Governors, may I just share with you that I have, I think it was raised with me at the quarterly um, uh, informal meeting, uh, about the role, the potential role of governors as we move forward to a, a place-based partnership. Um, I've raised that, to, Laura, you know this, don't you? I've, I've raised this through the, um, the, the local partnership arrangements. I am, of course, a, a key player in that in terms of the chair and, and non-exec group that's designing uh, all that stuff. There is no local decision yet on that. I can tell you that. So what I've done is, and, and I'm conscious of the public meeting, so of course this will be uh, broadcast, but I've actually written to our NHS provider governance lead colleague, uh, who's a trusted uh, uh, friend and associate and colleague of, of mine. Uh, he comes very, very highly recommended. John Coots is his name. If you ever see any of uh, his work, C-O-U-T-T-S. Uh, and I know that uh, today, I've had a response from uh, his team. Um, I've only been able to skim it very quickly, obviously, with the, uh, the commitments I've had. Um, but I think generally it, it talks to the fact of there is a spectrum from being uh, governors and having the, the governance role that you have within the individual trust and that affecting the way in which the partnership can work through to whether governors can be more involved in actual uh, uh, place-based partnership business. So there is a spectrum and it's clear, I think, uh, I need to read this properly yet, but it's clear, I think, that um, there is no suggested great practice quite yet as to how this will work. So it's been the nature of the, the thing, hasn't it? But, so all I can offer you as, as, as my governor colleagues is that I'm on this and I'm trying to find out what the right way in which we can make sure governors are well briefed. Um, does raise the issue, of course, that the, the integrated care board is beginning to develop. It's not quite yet uh, in place. It will, will be in shadow form. And so I think a briefing for governors as to how that's going to look uh, might well be, be helpful. Um, so sorry to piggyback on, the, the, on, on you there, John, with, with that point, but it, it raised it uh, as a useful opportunity for me to tell governors about that. Um, does anything arise, please, from the uh, pre-meeting uh, discussions that we've had and uh, for John's a very succinct report on the health and care plan and the development of ICBs, integrated care boards. OK, well, as I say, my promise to you is that I will keep you updated as to thoughts. And indeed, I would seek to um, take your views on the ways in which governors might be able to contribute to the work of the, uh, the partnerships. OK, given the crucial statutory role that you've got for, and, and for us, of course, in the, the single biggest healthcare provider in the district. 
So you are the you are the governors of that particular provider. So yeah, hopefully that was helpful. And thank you very much, everybody. May I move to item seven, which is masses raised with governors by members, patients, and the public. Um, Laura, again, I'm just looking. At you. I don't think we'd received any from governor colleagues that required action at this time. And of course, there are various ways in which governors can uh, inquire on the on, on behalf of uh, members and for the public uh, more generally. But may I ask whether did any governors have anything they wish to raise for attention, please, at this meeting? And it would appear not. And that avenue of uh, engagement remains open, of course. You can always send anything through to our governors team colleagues uh, where you just need to find out more information. Thank you, everybody. May I turn to item eight then, please, which is the uh, chairman's report. Uh, you can see that it kind of generally deals with uh, matters related to engagement with governors and, and working with governors and includes a, a brief update from the Board of Directors meeting held in November. Of course, it refers to the terrific appointment of Sugra as our latest non-exec director joining us and indeed the, uh, the requirement we have to release capacity to manage the uh, pandemic work. Uh, and the, the, the other things that are in there you can see. And just a reminder, lovely appendix from uh, Mark Holloway, our Director of Estates and Facilities, I hope you found in the um, Governor's Bulletin uh, from myself, uh, his update uh, particularly useful. Um, I know board colleagues really thought that was extremely helpful, just to give a flavour of the significant amount of work um, that goes on in there. So that's what that's about. I was only ever going to pick out one additional thing to mention to you, which came from our board meeting on uh, the 20th. So just last week, this time last week indeed. Uh, and it's something I was rather um, proud of as a board, that we'd taken a decision to prioritise disability, uh, particularly learning disability, amongst our waiting patients. Now, there's good reason for that because um, a, a recent uh, British Medical Journal paper reminds us that people with a learning disability are five times more likely to be hospitalised during the pandemic and eight times more likely to die during the pandemic, so COVID-related. Now, that's a national study. That's, that's not the Bradford figures I'm referring to. But we as a board took a decision that we endorsed the idea that within their reasonable prioritisation cohorts, the P numbers that uh, um, Kevin was talking about, that it would be right and appropriate to prioritise patients with learning disabilities. I'm sorry if I'm repeating something you guys, governors, already know. If you if you haven't read the paper, do please have a quick look at uh, the paper that's in there, which is paper 10 of our board meeting in uh, on the 20th of January, paper 10. It was under finance and performance, and that demonstrates the significant amount of action we've taken to try and identify people with learning disability and prioritise them, but also shows that we can evidence the fact that they are waiting uh, less time than other cohorts of, of general uh, public in, in their patient areas. So we are prioritising those with learning disability, uh, uh, given the inequalities that they, they face and our desire to achieve equity for all people. I think it's a fantastic uh, piece of work. So if you haven't read paper 10 from uh, board on 20 January, uh, please do have a look at that. Are there any questions arising from my report or indeed the additional matter I mentioned? Alistair, would you like to come in, please? <clears throat> Pardon me, just on that learning disabilities uh, question, which makes a lot of sense at face value, but I've got a question, which is uh, obviously um, that there are other groups that have suffered disproportionately during COVID. Um, so do they, do they also get priority? And are so many people getting priority that it's no longer a priority, if that makes sense. Yeah, of course it does, Alistair, yeah. And it, it doesn't override clinical prioritisation. This idea doesn't override clinical prioritisation. I don't know whether there's particular cohorts of patients by, um, by a, a particular uh, category that are being prioritised, other than the learning disabilities, but... Uh, uh, it doesn't override clinical prioritization, prioritization. Those that need to be seen quickly for safe reasons still are. Right. So I just wonder if it, if 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 there are any other high risk groups. I mean, 
such as diabetics just comes to mind, but I, but I know there are you know others that that should be considered as at equally high risk as those with learning disabilities. Yeah, I mean, it may be that, that it is by far the highest risk factor. I don't know, to be honest. But if there are others that are similarly high, have they been given similar consideration? Yeah, yeah. No, thank you for that, Alison. I, I won't try and answer that as a, as a non-clinician right now, but I'll raise that, uh, that, that issue at that point. And I know Sugra's point about uh, those with um, additional comorbidities. I'm pretty sure there are a number of examples um, where we were keen to support the, the work generally within the partnership on learning disability was related to prevalence in Bradford and the very clear evidence that they had uh, uh, significantly reduced outcomes, Alistair. But you make a great point because there may be other examples of that that I will pick up on. So uh, thank you for that. Yeah. So, you know, other examples. I'll make sure governor's informed of that. Thank you, Alistair. That's a good point. Yeah. And just check whether there's any further comments or questions. And I don't think so. So that's fine. Thank you very much. OK, uh, moving to item nine, I'll turn to our, our lead governor, Wendy, uh, in relation to the governor's nominations and remuneration committee report, which of course can be seen at item nine, but Wendy, would you wish to bring our attention to anything regarding that, please? Uh, no, it's fairly straightforward. Uh, we met um, on the 14th of December and uh, we just really had two items on the agenda. We were uh, updated on actually Sugra's appointment and we realised the outcome of that, so that's good. And uh, uh, the chair reappointment, Max, uh, which we were discussing in the closed session so yes, yes, yes. <laughs> uh, well, thank you very much <laughs> <laughs> thank you yeah thank you wendy yes so again of course i should just offer the opportunity for any governor uh, if, if they have any query regarding the uh, the content of the report and wendy's brief uh, reminder of what the key points were uh, nominations remuneration committee reports for governors as i always say a very very important uh, committee very important form. OK, and I think people are content with the uh, reports and the ability, of course, to chat with Wendy if there's anything further required, but there's no questions raised here. Thank you very much. At item 10, we have the reports from the board and they're simply to note, please, uh, the audit uh, committee report. I did have sincere apologies, of course, from Barry, who uh, was unable to join us today. Charitable Funds Committee and indeed the uh, Academy uh, reports. I wasn't going to encourage people to go through them particularly, but hopefully you've all had a chance to look at them. And I will, of course, pause again for a moment and see whether anything arose uh, in those minutes of the uh, academies, committees and various forums that might just want further detail. Wendy, would you like to come in, please? Um, I was just going to thank the non-executive directors for such good reports. They Really, you know, we're getting better and better at this, so that's uh, excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. That's, that's great to hear from a, a, a governor. Thank you. Yeah, that's very much appreciated and noted. OK, and if there's nothing further arises from them, I will take it that you've noted them. And I know I keep saying this, but it's not just the Council of Governors where we, uh, it, our engagement doesn't uh, st uh, start and finish here. So if there's anything that arises, please do raise it with us. Uh, there being no other business, I will turn to uh, to closing this meeting uh, with a review of the meeting. I appreciate it was slightly different uh, today. May I suggest that with a good input from exec colleagues offering uh, some insight into governors and opportunity to question. Uh, but is there anything else that anybody would like to raise with me regarding today's business? We're going to, of course, go into a closed uh, meeting. Um, uh, which the non-exec directors will not be joining us at, of course, that's purely for governors uh, and our director of governance. So I'll just see where there's no, nothing further arising from them. So thank you very much. There being no other business, we will close now. Um, the next meeting is scheduled 